today. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to introduce our seminar speaker for today, Dr. Birte Schillerup. She's from the University of Maryland. Birte has been at the University of Maryland since 2015. She's now an associate professor there. Uh, she did a five-year postdoc at University of Maryland and then taught for five years at Goucher College uh, in an actual more of a teaching position where she said she really honed her teaching skills. Um, she's the... <laughs> She's a, a senior editor uh, for the journal Biofilm. It's an, uh, an uh, Elsevier journal. And she also is very active in ASM, the American Society for Microbiology. Uh, she's like co-organizer, involved heavily in this. There, but every three years or so, the Biofilms conference meets. Um, and uh, that's where we recently met and spent some time in, in Charlotte together, uh, you know, having dinner and chatting. and. We were basically environmental engineers in a sea full of medical and dental oral oral biofilm people. Um, so it was kind of fun to find some like-minded folks to talk to <laughs> who weren't doing single species biofilms. Uh, anyway, uh, so I'd like to just welcome her and uh, enjoy hearing her seminar today. So thanks, Birta, for coming. Thank you for hosting me. Thanks for a kind introduction and for spending uh, Friday morning here. And I hear it's after spring break, so it's even more impressive that you made it to this point in that week. Uh, our spring break is next week, so I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to that too. But thank you. And please ask questions. Don't wait until the end. I hear there might be some uh, activated carbon class topics. So if you have any questions, just please ask them as we move along. That would be a great pleasure. And I'm very honored to uh, be in a distinguished lecture series. Um, and as I said to Dr. Novak before also, um, this place in the university and department has been on my travel list for many years because I live in Maryland, but spend quite a bit of my summers in Montana. Logistically, it just never worked out that we were stopping over here. So I'm very pleased that we do. And I like winter, so it's not bad weather. Um, so what I would like to talk about is biofilms, because some of us really like biofilms. As Dr. Fasowski said, I'm uh, quite uh, active in the biofilm world, in the environmental side of biofilm world. Um, and the other part of my uh, academic life has to do with uh, persistent organic pollutants uh, and environmental engineering, toxicity, and all of that. So we'll get to that. Um, a lot of what I've been doing the last 10, 15 years has been uh, either polychlorinated by phenols or chlorinated solvents. So there'll be a, just a tiny bit of organic chemistry. So I hope you'll be OK with that. So a lot of what I have been doing has been trying to figure out what are legacy contaminants and what are current contaminants. And it's a little bit messy. First of all, on PCBs, they are naturally occurring. The first ones were found in 1865 in a coal tar seam. Um, it is a little bit of a, a funny story and how also telling a little bit about how we should be curious about many things. Because as some of you might rightfully say, how can you detect PCBs that are an organic compound back in the 1865, where there probably weren't a whole lot of gas chromatography going on. There were birds found in museums in the 1920s that later on were analyzed. They took feathers out and then traced back and figured out all the way back that there actually were PCBs at that point, because there's been some discussion about whether it's a natural compound or it's a synthetic compound. The reason for our problems are all the synthetically produced PCBs from the 1920s up until the 70s when they were banned. Uh, and they look like this. It's a great bunch of compounds. There are 209 in total. You can see with all these positions that you can vary them all and then get to different configurations. That configuration has to do with their toxicity that we'll get back to at the very end. They are all hydrophobic. And a, uh, there are other characteristics that we'll get to also. But they've been used in very many different applications. Uh, this one here, if you, any of you are watching movies from the 1950s, you know that old truck that's driving out of these long gravel roads. There's this dust cloud. If you spray PCBs on that dust cloud, it'll all settle down. 
that's particles, right? So this toxic compound, you spray that, it all settles down, it's nice and not that dusty. It's also in flame retardants. It's in carbonless paper, industrial systems, hydraulic, probably most famous in transformers, because they are very inert. They do not break down with high temperature, pressure, which makes them great, great chemicals. It also makes them really hard to break down. And with the amounts uh, of mass that's out there, we have, a, we have a big problem, even if they're banned in the 1970s. The other part is with the change in climate, there is a lot of, maybe it doesn't seem like that outside today, but ice is melting in different places and whatever has been atmospherically deposited in those areas will now come out and be a part of the mobile phase. So this is a very conservative estimate of how much is in the world, so it's still a whole lot. Why do we care? We care because these compounds are uh, bioaccumulating and biomagnifying. They are hydrophobic, they are uh, following the food chain, and we happen to be at the top of that and care a lot about what we ingest. We also care because the sediments are ultimately the global sinks for these compounds. Wherever water leads to, it's gonna end up in sediment. These compounds have a multitude of toxicological effects. These are just a few. Cancer, endocrine disruptors, issues with uh, reproductive systems, immuno immunological issues, and so on. Some of them look like hormones. So you know the receptor binding uh, is going to mess us up. And it, it does. Um, and at this point, there aren't any of us who do not have uh, levels that can be detected. In populations where you rely a lot of um, animal food, um, then there are higher concentrations. We are working with um, a project in uh, Washington State where there are a no number of uh, tribal um, areas. There are fish consumption issues. They eat fish more than five times per week as a part of their natural diet. They are not allowed to because it will cause a lot of toxic issues. But what are they going to do? There are no alternatives. So it actually has a great uh, implication for quality of life also. So a part of the reasoning for working on this is all to show where PCBs are some of the big causes of water impairment. So Washington State is out here. We have a number of East Coast states. Some of them are coastal, for instance, Maryland is coastal, has a lot to do with the early industri industrialization, so historical impact. Baltimore was a main shipping harbor in the 1900s uh, and up into the century as well. And then we have a couple of locations in here uh, that happens to be some of the birthplaces for synthetic PCB manufacturing. Back in the days, some of the army installations had some PCB, PCB manufacturing going on, but there is also a Monsanto plant in Alabama that bought that whole synthesis, synthesis uh, manufacturing. And they have lots of issues. If any of you follow a little bit of history and civil rights history, there are a lot of the civil rights movement and people historical figures coming from that area. And now there's also a lot of environmental justice and uh, cleanup uh, discussions down there because a lot of, of these areas where there's a high, high concentration of PCBs are in, uh, in areas with a lot of poverty. Uh, so we are not per se working on that, but we are very aware that our uh, engineering topic have societal impact. So going a little bit back to Maryland and trying to figure out what's, what's legacy, what is back from the old days, and what is current. So this is Maryland. Baltimore is right here. Here we have the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and when I started out my postdoc a long time ago, we were sampling in Baltimore Harbor. It is unfortunately a really, really great place to collect samples for PCB analysis because the concentrations are high. Both in the sediment, as you can see here, 
quite high levels, but even in the surface water. And with this kind of group of compounds that are very hydrophobic and with their KOW values, the equilibrium should be towards PCBs sitting on the sediment. So if we can find anything in the water phase, it means that there's a lot. What are the units on the numbers? Nanograms per gram and on the left and nanograms per liter on the right. So that was a bit the motivation for us looking at this. So one of the first things I was set out to do was to analyze a number of core samples. Um, and the way to read the graph is the depth here of that core sediment from the top to the bottom. And then by uh, analysis, we figured out when the deposit, which year the deposit would have taken place. So the early one was the 1940s and then up until the surface sediment and the y-axis is the total PCB concentration in nanograms per gram. So there is a steady increase. We kind of, you know, without thinking a whole lot, the band was here and it seems to be at that point where the concentration really increases, which is kind of curious if there, if there truly was a band. So the other part of that study was to go out into a number of those tributaries that you saw on the other map to find or to collect surface samples of mud, basically. Throw your opponent samples in from a bridge where there's access and you get those uh, top samples and we analyze them, different locations, concentration nanograms per gram. You might see that the y-axis has a different unit. So we're talking about quite high concentrations here. And here we have divided them up in um, what we call um, homologs, so compounds that have one um, chlorine are here and so forth. So quite a bit of PCBs in surface waters. We cannot relate that to any of the historical contamination that we can identify in history books from Baltimore Harbor. So it is not only legacy PCBs that we are dealing with. So there are current sources. And to um, uh, Maryland is, is somewhat progressive in certain aspects, such as now we have TMDLs, total maximum daily load, put in place for certain watersheds for PCBs because there's a problem. The Chesapeake Bay is one of the uh, I think maybe one of the biggest estuaries on this side of the ocean and has quite a lot of value for fisheries, for recreation and so on. So it has a big impact. So what are those PCBs doing? What are they? Well, if you imagine this is a PCB uh, molecule, uh, it can go into worms, it can be ingested, the birds can eat it. It can also be resuspended, right? So a lot of what we have try to figure out is that heavy shipping traffic coming into Baltimore Harbor. I don't know if you saw, there was this a container ship stuck in the Suez Canal a little while ago. Its sister ship was stuck in the Chesapeake Bay. That resuspension was massive. Um, and then we're trying to figure out, can we do anything with biology to get these PCBs to go away? Is there an anaerobic, is there an aerobic process? What can we do to biodegrade? The problem is that there's so much that it's gonna take more or less forever. 50 years is very, very optimistic. Um, so this is where activated carbon comes in for the first time. About 20, maybe even 25 years ago, Dick Luthi from Stanford pioneered taking activated carbon bags. He put them out in uh, the tidal areas of San Francisco Bay. And the idea was to block some of this dispersion. Have PCBs absorb until activated carbon, think Brita filters, drinking water filters, and so on. So at least they would not be in the food chain. They would not move around. They would be stuck in the activated carbon in the sediment. And that's a great idea, except that they are not really going away, right? We would just move them to a different phase, and that would help on toxicity, at least the short term. But we didn't really know if there's going to be any impact on the biological processes in the sediment. So that's what we set out to look at. So first experiment, take your Poner sampler, go in to the side of Baltimore Harbor, get two buckets literally of mud and take it back to the lab. 
mix activated carbon into one and not in the other. Uh, the time scale is in days. This is one of the shorter experiments I did as a postdoc. Uh, and here, the chlorines per biphenyl, which is a measure for how many chlorines you have at the molecules. Baltimore Harbor had this Aerochlor 1260, was the, was the commercial uh, product, which had about 6.3 chlorines on average. Uh, so you remember, they could be from 1 to 10. And we did not see a difference in the degradation, the chlorination uh, over these 300 days. And normally you're super uh, disappointed when you don't see a difference because for some reason we like to see differences. We like to see st statistical significant differences. There was none. And then we thought, but wait a minute, maybe that's good news because that showed that there was no difference whether there was activated carbon or not in the way that the bacteria could approach the contaminants. So they could be taken out of the food chain, but they were still available. That was wonderful because then we could think further and then see what can we then do. So we took that same data uh, and here it is the day zero sample that's subtracted from the day 300 sample. So we can see what has taken place over that time. These are different groups of PCB congeners. So we're looking at a more detailed view of that same bucket. Uh, what's underneath here on the, on the lower side of the x-axis is decrease. So things that have disappeared. You see that over to the right. And on the upper side is everything that has increased during that experiment. So a lot of what happened was these heavier chlorinated, so the many chlorine compounds, were degraded, but only to this middle part if there was no activated carbon. So this is natural. This is taking place in many areas. But that bucket where the activated carbon was mixed in showed that the dechlorination moved all the way to the left, meaning there are very few chlorines left. And we hadn't seen that before. We checked the GC protocol. We did our controls. But it actually seemed to be the case. So what does that mean? That means that that's actually really good news because then we can have full dechlorination taking place. And at that point, there are not only anaerobic processes, as you have said, this is all anaerobic in very reduced conditions. But if we get congeners that get over here, then there is another group of organisms that can use those compounds as electron donor, as food, and then can, it can be mineralized. So that was another set of good news. And the, but why is that? What, why, why would activated carbon do that? It's just the filter material. Um, what's going on? And once again, I'm so happy for my students. Um, undergraduate student at Goucher College, that was mainly the, the teaching place, but we also did research. Chiara uh, did a lot of this work. She did fluorescence in cedar hybridization. Here of the sediment, we tried some different probes. And what she saw, it's not the best uh, image, but it's a clump of organisms. And in my world, a clump of organisms is a biofilm. And then we said, but, but, but why didn't we think about that? Because biofilms are present everywhere. Why didn't we think that that would be the way things were happening in the sediment? It's the natural mode of growth. Uh, we are engineers. Can we use it for something? Can we try to control it and manage it in some way? So that's where we thought further than Digluthi, saying, well, step one, we can absorb these contaminants onto activated carbon so they're out of the food chain. Check. Two, could we grow these biofilms that we know naturally occur, but can we grow them in the lab and try to make the conditions better uh, and then maybe make a delivery system that benefits from all these aspects that we have learned. So we try. This is a little a schematic illustrating what would normally happen, right? So normally these 
organisms are out in the sediment. You saw that from the bucket experiment, but there aren't very many. They don't make a very good living. There's lots of PCBs. Activated carbon works, right? We saw that in the bucket experiment, but it's very slow. They're sorb onto the activated carbon, but these few bacteria need to find that complex before something can happen. Instead, could we take the same carbon, the same bacteria, grow a biofilm before we add it into the sediment? The same everything have a higher concentration, higher numbers, they are ready to go and they're stuck, so they're not floating away. PCBs can still absorb and then we will have a higher degradation, higher dechlorination rate. So that seems to be a good approach, in theory at least. So this is what these activated uh, carbon particles look like. This is a composite of transmission, the gray, so you can see the particles. Scale bar is here, so 100 microns, so maybe 200 microns or so across here. This is a Calgon commercial type of activated carbon. We haven't manufactured it. Um, and then the green dots are our dechlorinating bacteria. Uh, and when we looked at biofilms and the many pictures at the conference that Dr. Hosowski referred to, people would not have called this a biofilm because in substrate-rich environments, we're talking about tens and hundreds of microns of slime. But for me, this is a biofilm because there are groups sitting together and we cannot see the depth, right? There might not be 100 microns, but we could in some areas have five or 10. I'm good. This is anaerobic microbiology with a very low energy yield. So we are very proud of this photo. So we, this was one of the summers at Center for Biofilm Engineering in Bozeman. And you know, if any of you would, would like to visit, I'm sure they would be happy. So we then took some other buckets of sediment, put those particles that you just saw into that had a number of different controls. So here, this is, this is our biofilm molecule from before. Here is the planktonic, the liquid culture by itself. Here we have activated carbon by itself. They also have effect. So we wanted to make sure that we captured that. And we have some of our experimental controls here. We also looked at the dechlorination rate and the unit is not one of those usual ones. This is millimoles percent per day. So it is slow, but here we actually had, um, I talked to Tim about, uh, we talked about uh, activated sludge and biosolids. This is the mixed biofilm that comes out of an anaerobic digester. So that also has effect. And these dechlorination rates for those two types of biofilms were significantly higher than anything else we did. So then we thought, okay, good. We did the same exercise as you saw before. You know, compared the first the initial results with the last. What disappears over time? Same here. You know, day zero. What happens? We see the same increase. We are now faster. 100 days faster. It might still sound like a long time, and it is, but it's in the PCB world quite fast. So this system shows the same as the natural system, and we are quite happy about that too. Then we say, okay, what's the reason then? Why are those two different? What could have taken place? Could there be different numbers of bacteria in these systems that would explain the whole thing? And this is showing our QPCR results that there were no different because were, were no different because we designed it in a way so there wouldn't be a difference, but we check and, and there was no difference. There's not any numbers difference. So what, what's left then? Is there a diversity of microbes? Is it the way they grow? Could we come up with other explanations? So I don't expect you to read this. This is a heat map of a bunch of sequencing results. What we are interested in is these higher hits over here, the most abundant types of organisms. If we look at all that data and then decide we want to look at 
fold increase to make sure that we have something significant. And here we define a two-fold increase as our lower cut. Then we see that there are many different types of organisms that have increased in numbers more than two-fold during that experiment. Um, most of them are anaerobic, no surprise. It was set up under anaerobic conditions. But a lot of them are not the ones that we added in with our biofilms. So suddenly there was a stimulation, priming, whichever term we use, of a bunch of other processes, right? Oil degradation, uh, toluene, a bunch of other degradation processes suddenly gets rolling because we add in activated carbon and biofilm, even if we targeted PCBs. So that was quite a surprising outcome. We haven't, as such, moved forward with that, but we are keeping it in our minds when we are analyzing data. So for the first part, we have shown this enhanced PCB dechlorination when we have activated carbon biofilm uh, complex. We have seen other than our usual suspects being activated in this process. Um, in fact, 18 groups uh, out of the ones we looked at. And all of these are also related to other contaminant uh, degradation processes under anaerobic conditions. Um, so that's wonderful research, right? But, but what does that actually mean? Uh, well, it could mean that we can try to look at different types of populations on our activated carbon if we want to clean up more compounds at the time. And as many places, Baltimore Harbor has no shortage of contaminants to clean up. So that might be a viable approach. Uh, so it's not only the target population we're looking at. So that's good news. But we're still wondering why. Because we would like to learn more so we can manage this a little more. So Stacy Capucci was a postdoc in my lab right now. She's actually doing PFAS work at uh, Bloomington, Indiana. She set out to figure out what could we do with this mechanism. Because activated carbon is a nice material, but it's also complex, right? Uh, it's conductive, it's sorptive, it has high porosity, has different types of surface active groups, and we can go down the list of different, varia different variables that could impact this. So she took a bunch of different materials so she could try to look at one parameter at a time. Uh, we have not manufactured any uh, of these compounds. These are commercially available because that was another part of our research was that if we find something that works, we want it to be available for people to go out there and, and use it. It is nice to manufacture materials for lab work so you can find the mechanism and so on, but is it then too costly to manufacture in bulk and would it be an actual solution? So that was another one of our, um, our thoughts. So Stacy spent a month in the confocal lab at Montana State University and did quantitative confocal microscopy of all of these many, many, many different types of materials, looked at different characteristics, highly sorptive, less sorptive, and so on. We also looked at biochar with the idea that biochar might have a little less uh, adsorptive capacity and it might desorb faster, so we could release faster if the bacteria could use it. And then she was looking at sorption and electri electrical conductivity as her main questions here. And after many, many, many hours of work, she was able to figure out that the increase in sorption capacity increases the biofilm coverage of those activated carbon particles that you saw. And the same could not be said if you're looking at materials with increasing conductivity or increasing electrical, uh, sorry, electrical conductivity or other types of parameters. So, coming out of all this was that sorption was the main characteristics for this type of material for promoting biofilm uh, formation and activity, so dechlorination of PCBs. 
So now we, we know that that is a, a parameter that we can manage and then follow further when we do this kind of, of work. And it is being done in full scale. We are not doing it, but other, uh, other groups are. So it, it has practical uh, implications. So that's great. But remember, we still have those current sources. So this was a lot of what's in the sediment. Um, there's been a lot of great bioremediation work done on PCBs. It's been funded millions of research. And in most areas, it showed that it didn't work. Didn't work meaning the fish tissue concentrations were increasing, right? So people could actually still not eat the fish, even though we bioremediated and did a lot of work. And then some people like to try to figure out, so is it because it didn't work? Or is it because there are current sources coming in that overshadow the work that was done? A and the latter is probably the case in most situations. So this is part of that stormwater work that we are a part of now. And a lot of what our focus is here is bioretention cells, so stormwater infrastructure. As you also know in this group, there are many different types of stormwater treatment options. Um, swale, sediment traps, bioretention cells, they all can be configured in very many different ways. We have been mainly interested in bioretention cells. Uh, there are a lot of them in Maryland. They can be configured in different ways. We have one on campus. So this is, again, Maryland. Here we have our campus. This is how it actually looks. This is our Xfinity Center. This is all the basketball games. We have parking lot over here, quite traffic heavy road here. And then these are stormwater auto samplers. There are two, one for influent, one for effluent. The channel runs into this bioretention cell here that's been there for 15 years or so. Um, this is where it runs into that bioretention cell. There's, as all places, some plastic, some other garbage, uh, and then it runs into this channel. Sitchi at this point set up, got all these, uh, uh, the biosamplers to work, cleaned out the ants, cleaned out the birds, uh, the snakes, you know, all that good stuff uh, that we never hear of in field work. Um, but, you know, I hope you won't experience some of those things, uh, but you might, or something else. Um, so when that was figured out, and she uh, had collected samples at the inlet, one foot away, three feet, nine feet, she looked at the concentrations of PCBs at the surface, but also in depth in her core samples. And it's not a surprise that, you know, the concentration at the surface is not changing a whole lot, but it's, con it's changing with depth. The big surprise is that there's a lot, because this is on campus. Where would this come from? Uh, we don't have any transformers or any of this in the area, right? So with kind of a low exposure environment, we see a lot. There's no issue detecting any of this. So that was actually my first surprise here. Um, so then we start thinking back to this whole biofilm concept, right? We know that soils have a lot of biofilms. We know that in, this is not the actual bioremediation cell, but it could be something similar. We have an aerobic phase at the top, anaerobic at the bottom. If we take kind of this cube and turn it around, then the way that we can get total mineralization of PCBs is imagining having biofilm on this soil particle. These anaerobic processes that we talked about before will happen to take place first. And then we lose chlorine, so there's access for aerobic bacteria to degrade, and then we can get complete mineralization. So ideally, that would be able to take place in bioretention cells because we have dry periods, we have saturated periods, we have, you know, there might be some tightly bound water on the soil particles, there might be some other water around. So Sitchi 
looked at some of these parts and looked at, are the bacteria at least present that can do this? And they are. In the top parts, there are no anaerobic bacteria. That's OK. But these bacteria are present if the conditions are right for them to do their work. So we are now trying to figure out how we can manage that thinking about the sediment experience. Because the other part we're looking at is toxicity. And now we have a terrestrial system. And a part of what we need to look at is what are some of their exposures. So we don't have to worry about fish. We have to worry about birds. So some of this is also translated, taking the concentrations of PCBs, here, some of them have different toxicity depending on that configuration that we talked about in the beginning. And if we multiply all the factors into the concentrations, we see how these values um, either actually increase at the, at the start of the entrance to this bioretention cell or decrease with depth at the end. But there is still toxicity there is still actually um, a risk in our system. So just to round up, some of the results that I didn't show was some of the work that we have done on where are, what are the sources of some of these non-legacy contaminants. There's stormwater, but where does the stormwater come from? We'll talk about that. There's wastewater. There are PCBs in wastewater, lots of wastewater. Um, some of what other projects have shown is that building material from before 1977-ish has PCBs in a lot of the paints, moldings, caulking, all of that stuff. Also in paints, roadway paints. PCB 11 is commonly found in the yellow stripes on the sides of the road. Uh, actually also sometimes in yellow print on shirts, sorry. Um, <laughs> even though it's not supposed to be present in any kind of products, but it, if you read into things, it cannot be the main product. It can be a byproduct of chemical synthesis. So the, then there's a discussion about what does by mean, byproduct, does it mean 49.9% or in my word, it probably should not be that. It shouldn't be there at all. So that's some of the other work. We're trying to figure this out. What about recycling, brief uh, use of building materials? In Maryland, we take everything to the recycling station, divide windows there, doors there, whatever there. And it is supposed to be reused. Uh, maybe we shouldn't just do that, right? Because whatever happens up to come to the recycling station is often old stuff because people don't want it anymore. That's kind of how it's designed. But maybe we should just not do that without, you know, uncritically. In our civil engineering world, um, some of this pavement, some of the construction material also have PCPs in them. In the name of reuse and waste reduction, there's a good point of doing that, we might end up reusing, putting sources of contamination out in other environments that we didn't think of because we didn't think that they were there. Um, and actually, I think it's a there is a research in Norway from their transportation um, organization showing that they have found PCBs in um, construction material in roads. So that's a little bit of the not so good side, but we're trying. We do know that there, there is some hope in bioretention cells that we can degrade PCBs. We can look at how we can utilize the existing biofilms, use the same bioremediation approach. So there is hope, even though it's slow and we need to do a lot more work to make it uh, commercially uh, practical and have a real impact. None of this was done without a bunch of people and lovely, lovely students involved in very many places. Research at a teaching institution is hard, but it can be done. Um, 
we have had a lot of great collaborators. A bunch of these students are in very many different places. I don't think actually there might be any here, um, but there could be. So it is a pleasure to work with students and lovely collaborators also. And if any of you are doing biofilm research, we would definitely be happy to uh, receive uh, manuscripts. It's a fairly new uh, journal, five years old. We're expecting our impact factor this year. We are expecting it to be between 5.6 .6 and 6, based on all the metrics that goes into that. Thank you very much. Okay, time for questions. Thanks, Bertha. Really nice talk. Um, I so I wondered. Um, it seemed interesting that DF1 didn't do better than your mixed biofilm from activated sludge, and I wondered if you had any. Um, thoughts as to why that, that was? Because DF1 was isolated from Baltimore Harbor, right? Actually, it was out isolated from um, Charleston Harbor in Char South oh, Carolina. Okay, okay, Not okay. that it makes much of a okay, difference, okay. but the East Coast Harbor. So um, actually, there might be some interesting th talks or discussion with Tim about that, too. But that consortium coming out of the wastewater ha also has other dechlorinating organisms. Yeah. So we have looked at that in another study. So it might just be that there are different ways of dechlorinating and DF1 can, you know, sorry, it's getting te dechlorination technical, uh, can only have, they, it's only having certain activities. Yeah. Whereas if you have a diverse population, it could have different uh, dechlorination uh, activities. And I wondered if, and maybe you got at this to some extent with your sequencing data, but I wondered if you've seen if you've tried to deploy these in situ, the activated carbon biofilms, and if you've seen a, a change in the microbial community, because I'm thinking of the work that they've done at Rutgers where they have tried to bioaugment, and then they see their bioaugmented organisms going away, and but other dechlorinators showing up. Right. Um, especially if they try to stimulate them. And I, I would wonder if you would see something similar here. Yeah, so that I, I don't know. You we don't know, got, yeah, we okay. got cut short. Um, there's it's PCB work, I understand. Yes, no, but <laughs> so there's been a pandemic and stuff going on. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. No, but that's you. very true. And that's the, the interesting thing to do. Okay. No, so they have shown a lot of that, the priming effect yeah. and have, you know, helping something start. Um, what was it? It was um, uh, um, a potato, some kind of uh, chlorinated compound that was allowed to spray on potatoes. Okay. So it was allowed for food consumption-ish that could then be used as a primer in sediment that then started some of the dechlorination. Yeah, yeah, they were using chlorinated naphthalene type. I don't know. So I think the, yeah. it was actually okay to spray on potatoes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it was somewhat harmless. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I can read it. It's from Mariah. She's a graduate student working on a project that involves dehalogenation of contaminants by biochar. And in her literature review, she encountered studies researching pre radical formation and release from biochar and AC materials as well as other prebiotic mechanisms of contamination transformation. <clears throat> Do you think some abiotic mechanisms could be responsible for the PCB transformation in the presence of AC? So yes, so uh, uh, that chart, right, the very, one of the controls was activated carbon by itself and something did happen. So I think she's absolutely right on that. But if you combine it with bacteria, there's more happening. So I think it's absolutely true that it can happen. But the synergy, the added effect, is, is much bigger. So I want to go back to your uh, granular activated carbon. I tried to do the calculation in my head and didn't do a very good job of it. But looking at how quickly it, it happened and the mass that you had to put in there, it seemed like if you're going to clean up 
Chesapeake Bay, it would be immense. Right. So much so that it, it, it seems like the granulated carbon concept as a field solution is unrealistic. Am I wrong? Uh, no, but uh, it, there might be locations where it is applicable because in certain, you know, it's no, it's by no means the solution to, to everything evil PCB on this planet. Uh, but in certain areas, it could, there could be conditions where it would be either the only um, practical approach or the only thing you are in other ways could be able to do. So a lot of these uh, activated carbon approaches are used in uh, wetlands, in uh, areas with high ecological value because the alternative is to dig the whole thing up and ruin it. And then there's also a lot of resuspension going on. So there are many things to navigate. It's also being used in, um, in uh, very deep piers um, because you, it is, even though it, it can be eroded when sh big ships come in and a lot of the naval ships are really, really big, uh, it can stabilize the surface if you're down deep because the propellers and everything can cause a lot of damage. But you're right, it, it is not the solution for everything. The, the part that might be okay is that while we are waiting for the bacteria to do their job, we're taking the PCBs out of the food chain. So we're at least reducing the toxicity because it's there. There's not a whole lot we can do. So you, I, I might not understand this quite perfectly, but I guess my thought was looking at the activated carbon stimulating dechlorination, how much of it that is the fact that the activated carbon is sorbing things that would serve as electron donors for the re reductive dehalogenation? And how much, like, is that understood or known or anything like that? I just talk about it, please. No, that is not understood, but it's a very, very good point. Um, so I think a part of why it might work so well is the close proximity of everything an organism needs, including donor, but for sure also acceptor. But um, so DF1 has some particular preferences for electron donors, but a lot of other uh, halogenators have wider uh, preferences. But we actually haven't looked into that. A part of our show. Right. Right. That yes. Or yes. 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 Yeah. So I think that's a very important point, and particularly in that mixed culture, uh, because we so the idea for the activated uh, for the biosolids from from a wastewater treatment plant is that we have seen that there is a really high number of dechlorinating organisms in that material. We happen to be in uh, D.C. where there's one of the most advanced wastewater treatment plants where they have thermophilic hydrolysis and a whole bunch of things. So the biosolids are the cleanest it can get. Um, so with that regard, we have actually also used it, and EPA have allowed us to use it in a, um, in a field scale, um, digging a trench in a ground, TCE uh, groundwater contaminated Superfund site where that same material has been put in. And for sure in that environment, the electron donors coming with that material were essential. So that's a very good point. Thank you. Um, I was very surprised <coughs> in this presentation when you pointed out that PCBs are more current, more prevalent, and they're in our road paint. Uh, and you don't hear about that. I haven't heard about it from anybody. There are a and couple of other groups that have made that clear. Yeah. So I'm thinking there are over 200 cogeners of uh, PCBs. I'm hoping that there are different toxicity levels for different right. PCBs. So, right. so different PCBs have different toxicity levels to humans and to other, other organisms. So I'm hoping that they stay away from the highly toxic PCBs I don't know if this is true, but this is in, the, in, a, in a world that you might logically I imagine, 
and that if they're using PCBs, they work with the PCBs that are less toxic. Is that not true or is that true? Um, so what we know so far is that PCB11 is a, a dye, so it has two chlorines. Uh, it's in yellow. And I think it's PCB54 that has three or four, I can't remember, that's in white. And then I can't remember what's in blue and green. But white and yellow are the most abundant road paints that we have. But it's not controlled because it's a synthesis byproduct. So nobody actually cares. There, there's no regulation saying that Sherman Williams or whoever is making the paint uh, should control for PCBs because uh, I, it's a synthesis product. Uh, that, that, that's a, a terminology that I'm not familiar with. What is a synthesis byproduct? So chemical synthesis, when they make the formulation of the paint. Um, so uh, I'm not an organic chemist, uh, but you know, in organic chemistry, they do you know, make the polymers, maybe you know. Um, you know, the way that they manufacture these polymers that end up being paints and so on. Yeah. So, the, uh, so the, a synthesis byproduct, does that mean that when you combine the chemicals that these PCBs show up? Is that what a synthesis byproduct means? Yes. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. But they also don't want to talk to us about it. Yeah, I think she, what she's trying to say is that, that it's not an additive or it's not part of the manufacturing, but it ar arises as part of the manufacturing process. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like, I don't know, contaminants. Not, not really contaminant, but you know, like a, an unintentional byproduct. Yeah. Mary, was there a question online? Okay. Uh, this question is from Greg Lefevre. Based on your biofilm results, does the full degradation go from anaerobic to aerobic to full chlorination? Is the aerobic a critical step? That's also a very good point. We have not focused a lot on aerobic because the anaerobic process is the bottleneck. And if we can get it to a point where the PCB congeners are um, able to be aerobically degraded, in our world, then there are a multitude of organisms that can do it. So that has not been a, a part of our focus. But it's a very good point. Hi, Greg. Glad that you're online from Iowa. Uh, thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, one result that really caught my attention was how the PCB increases in concentration as you go down in depth. And I wonder if that has to do with the idea that maybe aerobic bacteria actually degrades more PCB than anaerobic bacteria, or there are other factors uh, for that observation. Excellent observation, because those aerobic bacteria could definitely do a good job at the top parts where uh, there's a lot of aerobic conditions present, even though you know it rains a lot in Maryland. So, and, and what you're pointing out is that we're looking at the total. We're not looking at the different types of congeners. So that could very well be a good point. OK. I guess that concludes our presentation. Please join me in thanking uh, Pirta. And